Good evening. Good evening. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for love and thankful for the blessings. We pray now that you will be with the meeting as we watch another part of Keeps of the Flame. And we pray, Lord, for the presence of thy Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to help us to understand and learn and retain. In Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to share is called the love of God. Welcome, Brother Desire. The time is yours. Thank you.
Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you, sisters, for uh, that uh, beautiful song, The Love of God. Um, I think we will never fully understand and fully get to the bottom of understanding uh, the depth of the love of God. Now, brethren, uh, I pray you all had a wonderful day. It is uh, indeed a privilege to be back. Uh, as we continue to um, learn our history, I said the, uh, the, 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 the title of, um, or rather the theme of um, the messages this week is know your history, know your identity. So far, we've been able to watch uh, episode one, two, and three. Today, we're going to move into uh, we're going to move to watch episode number four. So um, uh, I'm sure we're, um, some of these things we might have been familiar with these things, but it's it's always good to, to refresh our memory. You know, once in a while, I think it's important that we remind ourselves where we have come from, who we are as a people and where we're going, what is our mission, what is our purpose. And I am afraid that because not much time is being spent uh, educating um, 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 our people on our identity. And hence, you know, many people question as to what makes us um, uh, different? Why do we um, claim to be different from anybody else? So uh, may God help us as we continue to learn that we'll see really what uh, makes us a peculiar people. Right. Uh, let me just uh, hasten to share the text that we have um, shared together in the past, and then I will and get into the presentation, uh, into the um, uh, to the documentary. Um, today I think it's about thirty-two minutes or so, so we have um uh, enough time at the end to come back to discuss um um and share our thoughts. Maybe something that uh, that will stand out for you. Please make a note so we can discuss afterwards. Or if it's a question, please um, bring the question afterwards and so we can discuss. All right. Now, before we do that, let's just uh, open our scriptures to um, just solidify why we're doing this. If we turn our Bibles again to Jude 1, uh, Jude only has one chapter. Uh, before we do that, uh, maybe let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, allow me to pray again before we read uh, from Jude. Um, um, that's Jude chapter 1, uh, Jude verse 4 and 5. There's only one chapter in Jude. Let's begin with the word of prayer and then we will read from Jude. Shall we pray? Our Father which art in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we want to thank you for keeping us all the day. Thank you for your protection and for your mercy. Thank you for bringing my brethren and myself back again this evening to learn what is truth. Lord, may you um, forgive us of our sin. Give me, Lord, of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse each and every one of my brethren as we listen to these words. Lord, we pray that you may speak to us, challenge us. We ask that you may provoke our thoughts. May our hearts burn as we learn um, um, of the faithfulness, the courage. Um, 
and the uh, commitment, the dedication that uh, our uh, pioneers uh, head towards your work. I pray, Lord, that we may be challenged and be inspired. We ask that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Help us not to forget the things that we shall learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can somebody read for us, please? That's uh, Jude uh, verses 4 and 5. Uh, rather, uh, it's verse 3 I'm looking for. Let's just read um, verses 2 and 3. Jude verses 2 and 3. If somebody is able to read for us, please. Jude 2 and 3. Yes. And it reads, um, Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. And verse 3, and he says, Beloved, when I gave all dig diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister uh, Dion, for that reading. Now, turn again to one more scripture. Uh, this, is, uh, this one is quite fascinating from Hebrews chapter 11. We all know Hebrews chapter 11. Chapter 11 is uh, a chapter uh, that has an account of uh, the deeds of uh, those who have gone before us. Um, I'm sure if this chapter was written during um, the time of these brethren, their names would have also appeared in Hebrews chapter 11. But nonetheless, I want us to, to read about this uh, faithful man. Uh, uh, it's Joseph we're looking at. That's verse 22. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. Somebody else can read for us, please, verse 22. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 22. Hebrews 11, verse 22. Mm -hmm. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. <laughs> that is a powerful text, brother. See, when you read the book of Hebrews, um, remind me to come back to this text after we watch the documentary. There's a lot that could have been recorded about Joseph, but inspiration uh, uh, picks this about Joseph that he made mentions, mention. That when he was going to die, they were supposed to keep his bones and keep his bones and take them to the promised land. Powerful statement, powerful text. But anyway, we're going to get now to our documentary. I'm going to share the screen. Um, um, uh, where is it now? Okay, screen, we start the sharing. And uh, once the video, I went at the end of the video, like I said, please, if you have um, um, if you have some thoughts, feel free to share the thoughts. And then we will discuss together. Today we're watching episode number four, After the Disappointment. Modern manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. Let's uh, go to the start.
The Erie Canal was the first major waterway built in the United States. Opened in 1825, it crossed the state of New York from Buffalo near Niagara Falls in the west to Albany on the Hudson River in the east. About half an hour's drive east of Rochester lies the small town of Port Gibson. Located on the canal, it was once the main shipping point for the area. It was also the home of an active Methodist layman, Hiram Edson, who in 1843 accepted the message of the soon coming of Christ taught by William Miller and his associates. With tens of thousands of others across the United States, the Millerites of Port Gibson waited with earnest expectation for October 22, 1844. For on this day they expected the Lord to come as the fulfillment of the 2,300 day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. But as the clear morning light of the following day shone upon the canal waters, these same believers were overcome with disappointment and despair. Just how they came to see beyond their own misunderstanding to the clear light of God's leading in three distinct ways is the substance of our story. There were many Adventist believers who gathered at Hiram Edson's farm on October 22, 1844. Researchers established that this was his house though rooms have been added on both sides since the time Edson lived here. On that cool October morning, the disappointment of Edson and his friends became all too real. That slips off the tongue mighty easily, young fella. I beg your pardon, sir? I don't think you have any idea how devastated we were. What do you mean? I'm telling you we experienced the worst kind of doubt some of us with more bitterness than others. We wondered if the prophecies of Daniel were wrong. We wondered if maybe the Bible was a fairy tale. And some of us even wondered if there was still a God in heaven. We went to my barn back there and we prayed. And after re-examining our faith, we decided that there had to be an answer to our dilemma. And what was that? Well, after we'd eaten breakfast, I suggested to young Owen Crozier that we visit some of our neighbors in the area here and see if we could encourage them a bit. I'm not sure if it was because of our fear of our mocking neighbors, but anyway, we headed out across my cornfield. All that corn. We'd been so sure of Christ's second coming that I'd left the whole crop standing in the field. Have an ear of New York's finest. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, as we walked along that morning and I reviewed in my mind the events of the previous 24 hours, suddenly I stopped and looked up into heaven and it seemed as if the heavens opened and across my mind flashed the arrangement of the sanctuary. You know, we Millerites have been preaching the text until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed? And we thought that that sanctuary was this earth. Well, later we realized that the Bible teaches that there's a sanctuary in heaven too. And Christ had moved like the high priest in the Day of Atonement from the holy place to the most holy place on October 22, 1844. Our Lord had a work to perform in heaven before returning to this earth. That's where Brother Miller had made his mistake. The Lord was good. He had heard our morning prayer. Well, so long, young fella. So long. In the following months, Hiram Edson and his associates continued to study the subject of the sanctuary and its cleansing. As they thought of their own experience, they marveled at the similarities between their own disappointment 
and that of the disciples at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Eventually, Edson persuaded his friend Crozier to publish their findings in an extra edition of the Millerite journal, The Day Star, February 7, 1846. But meanwhile, a second significant development was taking place here in Washington, New Hampshire. Two years earlier, in 1844, a Seventh-day Baptist lady had shared with a group of Millerite believers here her conviction that the seventh day of the week should be observed as the Sabbath. The Christian observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath has persisted throughout the Christian era. At times it has been driven underground, but it has always reappeared to urge its message upon the world. From the days of the Apostles down to the 5th century, it continued in various parts of the Roman Empire. However, as the Christian Church slipped further and further into apostasy and adopted the idolatrous rites and practices of sun worship, the Seventh-day Sabbath was soon discredited, its observance suppressed, and in its place, Sunday was exalted as the day of worship. During the Reformation of the 16th century, Luther took his stand on the Bible as the supreme authority for the Christian. To Charles V, he declared, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. This appeal to the Bible and the Bible only was the very foundation of the Reformation. As the Reformation continued, dialogue soon arose within the church over the question of Sunday and the Sabbath. The Sabbath keepers asserted that there was no Bible support for the observance of Sunday. As a result, the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath spread throughout Europe, including England. There, agitation over the Sabbath became the center of controversy among the Puritans throughout the 17th century. Influential people were involved. Among the many who advocated the observance of the seventh day was a London barrister and a Commonwealth Speaker of the House of Commons. By the mid-1660s, there were many congregations in England keeping the seventh day. A member of one of them was Dr. Peter Chamberlain, physician to three Stuart kings, James I, Charles I, and Charles II of England. A contemporary of John Bunyan, Chamberlain was a keen Bible student. On his tombstone in the churchyard at Woodham Mortimer, these words have been written. As for his religion, he was a Christian keeping the commandments of God and faith of Jesus being baptized about the year 1648 and keeping the seventh day for the Sabbath above 32 years. Chamberlain was a member of the Seventh-day Baptist Church, a small group that had separated from the Baptist Church in the early 1600s because of their convictions concerning the Sabbath. In 1664, Stephen Mumford, a Seventh-day Baptist from England, emigrated to the New World. In 1671, he organized the first Seventh-day Baptist church in America at Newport, Rhode Island. During the next 170 years, their influence spread throughout America until in 1843, Seventh-day Baptists numbered about 5,500. In that year, their general conference voted on a most significant resolution that the first day of November next be observed by our churches as a day of fasting and prayer, that Almighty God will arise and plead for His holy Sabbath. 
Little did they anticipate the manner or the magnitude of the answer to their prayer. Within months of their day of prayer, a Seventh-day Baptist widow, Mrs. Rachel Oakes, decided to move to the little village of Washington, New Hampshire. Her 18-year-old daughter, Delight, had accepted a position there as a schoolteacher. Driving into Washington today, the marker on the roadside states that this is the birthplace of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What happened here to attract such a title? This sturdy wooden church is today located far from the town centre, but once it was set in the middle of a thriving farm community. In 1844, Frederick Wheeler was the Methodist circuit-riding pastor of this church. Two years earlier, after reading William Miller's books, Wheeler began to teach the soon coming of Jesus. The majority of his congregation here also adopted Miller's teachings. One Sunday morning, Wheeler was at this desk in the Washington, New Hampshire church, conducting the communion service. During the sermon, he encouraged the people to be faithful in keeping all ten of God's commandments. Mrs. Oakes, the Seventh-day Baptist, who was attending here for fellowship, could hardly contain herself. When the pastor visited her soon after, she seized her opportunity. Hello, I'm Rachel. glad to see you. Good to see you. I've been looking forward to this. I want to talk to you about something important. What, what, is, what is the subject today? Come in. Thank you, Mrs. Oaks. It's a lovely fire. In Sunday service, Reverend Wheeler, you said that everyone who confesses Christ should obey all God's commandments. I am strongly of that opinion, sister. Well, I'll be making it clear. I came near standing up right then and there and saying something. I sensed as such. What did you want to say? I wanted to tell you that you had best put that cloth back on the communion table until you begin to keep all God's commandments yourself, including the fourth. And so Frederick Wheeler was introduced to the Sabbath truth. Soon after, he kept his first Sabbath, preached a sermon on it, and thus became the first Sabbath-keeping Adventist minister. Not long after the great disappointment, William Farnsworth, then in his late thirties, stood up in the Farnsworth family pew during the service and declared his intention to keep the Sabbath also. He was soon followed by his younger brother Cyrus, who was in his early twenties, his own wife and father and others. Forced to withdraw from fellowship, these first Sabbath keepers met in the large Farnsworth home not far away. It was not until some years later that they acquired eventual ownership of this church. Adjacent to the church is the graveyard where many of these early Seventh-day Sabbath keepers lie buried. This marker reveals that Cyrus Farnsworth later married Rachel Delight Oakes, the school teacher and daughter of Mrs. Rachel Oakes. A short time after Wheeler commenced to keep the Sabbath, a second Millerite minister, Thomas Preble, joined him. Preble was a free will Baptist who had travelled with William Miller and proclaimed the soon coming of Jesus. He became the first Sabbath keeping Adventist to advocate the seventh day Sabbath in printed form in an article he published in February 1845. Among the many who read his article 
which was later printed as a tract, was Joseph Bates, a retired sea captain. He was impressed with its truth. Some years before, Bates had accepted the teachings of William Miller. He held key positions in the Millerite movement and managed to weather the storm of the disappointment of 1844 without losing his faith. Hearing of the company of Sabbath keepers in Washington, he journeyed there, but on the way met with Frederick Wheeler on his Hillsborough farm. The Sabbath, uh, just having difficulty. They studied the Bible together throughout the night. What I do study, I, I feel confident, is... Next morning, they both went to Washington to Cyrus Farnsworth's home. Here at the Farnsworth home in 1845, after further study with Wheeler and Farnsworth, Bates made his decision about the Sabbath. Returning home, Bates was crossing the bridge between Fairhaven and New Bedford, Massachusetts. Only the approaches to the bridge remain today. On the bridge, Bates met an old friend, James Madison Munro Hall, who asked him a question. What's the news, Captain Bates? The news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. And Bates devoted the remainder of his life to proclaiming that news. In August of 1846, Bates published his own tract, The Seventh Day Sabbath, A Perpetual Sign. Its contents pointed to a spiritual heritage received not only from the Seventh-day Baptists, but also from the English Puritans and others before them. It contained as well an important new idea that heralded the prophetic significance of the developing Seventh-day Adventist Church. After Bates had begun to keep the Sabbath, he noticed something that the Millerites had overlooked. They had seen their movement as the fulfillment of the first and second angel's messages of Revelation 14, which were to be proclaimed prior to the second coming of Jesus. But there was also a third angel's message. Bates noted that Revelation 14 and verse 12 describes the people who are preaching these messages as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This confirmed in his mind the importance of keeping the commandments. It seemed to him that the time had come for a people who had proclaimed the first and second angel's messages to recognize the third message and to keep the commandments of God and the Sabbath, the fourth command, enjoined. Earlier in 1846, Bates received a copy of the Daystar Extra, which explained Hiram Edson's insights into the heavenly sanctuary and Christ's ministry in the most holy place. He began to correspond with Edson and accepted his invitation to a conference to be held in Port Gibson later that year. There, Edson shared his insights into the sanctuary. But Bates, too, had something to share. As Bates outlined his reasons for keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, Edson jumped to his feet and declared, That is light and truth. The seventh day is the Sabbath, and I am with you to keep it. And keep it he did till the day of his death. But in his conversation with the Port Gibson leaders, Bates also began to see a connection between the Sabbath and Christ's ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary.
Jesus was at the center of both teachings. In one, he was the all-sufficient sacrifice as God's lamb, as well as high priest, ministering the blood and cleansing the sanctuary. In the other, he was the creator of the world and giver of true rest. The 1846 conference was the first public expression of such a connection. At this conference, Bates listened with great interest to Edson's ideas about the heavenly sanctuary. He knew that the Bible taught that the Ark of the Covenant was located in the sanctuary's second apartment and that inside the Ark were the Ten Commandments. With great interest, therefore, he read Revelation 11:18, which speaks of the final days of Earth's history, when the nations would be angry and the time had come for the world's last judgment. But then in the next verse he read that at the same time the temple of God or the heavenly sanctuary was to be opened and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Bates reasoned that if Jesus' ministry in the most holy place was now the focus of attention, then the ark, its law, and the seventh day Sabbath that law commanded also assumed new importance. The fulfillment of the 2,300 year prophecy in 1844 had therefore drawn attention to the heavenly sanctuary in a way never seen before. As a result, two special emphases concerning Jesus emerged. First, he was now engaged in his final work as our high priest in the most holy ministry of that sanctuary. Second, he was Lord of the Sabbath day and had both commanded the seventh day to be kept holy and observed it himself as our divine example. But there was to be a third distinguishing sign associated with God's great final proclamation of the gospel. It too was to come from Jesus. For in Revelation 12, 17, it is identified as the testimony of Jesus. Just what does this mean? In Revelation 12, John describes the woman clothed with the sun representing the church. He sees her waiting for the birth of Jesus, then persecuted and led away into the wilderness where God protects her for a period of 1,260 years. Verse 17 then says, The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. A comparison between Revelation 19.10 and 22.8 reveals that the testimony of Jesus, declared to be the spirit of prophecy, operates through the prophets, those individuals he has chosen to speak his testimony to his people. The Old Testament prophet Joel records, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The context of these verses points to their ultimate fulfillment in the days before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The 19th century revealed several impressive fulfillments of this prediction. In the late 1830s, a young American black who was converted at the age of 17 moved here to Boston, Massachusetts to prepare for the gospel ministry. His name was William Foy. During 1842, Foy received two impressive visions. He later published a description in a pamphlet entitled The Christian Experience of William E. Foy together with the two visions he received in the months of January and February, 1842. On Tuesday evening, January 18, 1842, 23-year-old Foy was meeting with a group of Christians for prayer and Bible study here in Beacon Hill, Boston. During the meeting, he experienced the first of four visions. It lasted for two and a half hours, 
during which a Dr. Cummings examined him and could find, and I quote, no appearance of life except around the heart. Dear brother In his sisters, vision, Foy witnessed the rewards given to the righteous at the second coming and was shown the matchless beauty of heaven. He was hesitant to share his visions, for he knew the prejudice against blacks. But less than three weeks later, he was given another vision while meeting in a crowded church. This vision, lasting 12 and a half hours, revealed the scenes of the great judgment day. It is with deep regret that I must now pass judgment upon your life. As a child, you were fortunate to have the benefit of God-fearing and loving parents. As the scenes passed before him, he saw that neither profession, politics, nor status can save, only a relationship with Christ. In fact, if notice had been taken of his vision concerning the pre-advent judgment, perhaps the great disappointment two years later may have been softened, if not avoided altogether. Foy was told to relate to others what he had seen, and during the months that followed, he preached extensively, creating a sensation wherever he went. Vast crowds heard him tell of what he had seen of the heavenly world and the need to prepare for it. It appears that two more visions were given to him, including one revealing three steps to the heavenly city, which he did not understand. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences... No more visions were given to William Foy after the disappointment. However, he maintained his hope in the second coming of Christ. He continued as an esteemed and beloved preacher in small rural communities, finally settling in East Sullivan, Maine. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world, for witness unto all nations. There he died in November 1893, and was buried here in the Birch Tree Cemetery. Shortly before the Great Disappointment, God placed the prophetic gift on another, Hazen Foss, who lived in Poland, Maine. He was 25 years old, well-educated, a good speaker, and a believer in the soon coming of Jesus. In his first vision, he was shown the journey of the Advent people to the city of God. It corroborated with Foy's visions and included a view of three steps by which God's people approached the holy city. After the disappointment, he was told to relate what he had seen. Fearing opposition, Foss refused. In a second vision, he was again urged to share what he had seen, but still he refused. A third vision followed, in which he was told that he was released, and that the burden would be laid upon one of the weakest of the weak, who would do the Lord's bidding. A few weeks later, Foss stood outside the door of a little chapel, listening to a miraculous story. He was urged to come into the meeting, but he refused. The manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, and grapes, and the other fruit. I asked Jesus to let me eat of them. He said, not now. Those that eat of this fruit return to earth no more. You must go back and relate to others that I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down. What he heard was an account of a vision almost identical to the one given him. <laughs> Who was it that Foss saw that night? Her name was Ellen Harmon, a 17-year-old girl so ravaged by tuberculosis it threatened to take her life. She could barely speak in a whisper and was often wakened from sleep by coughing and bleeding in her lungs. Yet God took this weakest of the weak and called her to give the testimony of Jesus to his people. Empowered by God's Spirit, she was to bear that testimony for the next 70 years. The explanation of the sanctuary, the seventh-day Sabbath truth, and a modern manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. 
These three key revelations helped lead many through the disappointment of 1844. And it was the last of these in the person of Mrs. Ellen Gould White, who was to continue to act as a compass for this fledgling group of believers well into the 20th century. It is to her story we turn next. Amen. Amen. Uh, what uh, a story, brethren. Uh, I'm sure you were following there, right there, as we were seeing uh, um, how things uh, were unfolding, how our history continue to unfold. Um, I wonder if there's something that stood out for somebody there, brethren. Um, so basically the apps, the documentary that we've just watched um, was focusing on what took place after the great disappointment, which is uh, the one we watched yesterday and how um, uh, God used these brethren. There was a handful of them who, after the disappointment, uh, continued to pray and sought uh, God even more earnestly in prayer until God revealed what had happened on the 22nd of October, 1844. That instead of Christ coming to earth, he had moved from the holy place into the most holy place, uh, apartment of the sanctuary in heaven. And we had also um, the um, Sabbath question. Whereas these brethren, they, they were uh, following the light that they had at the time, but God in his mercy again, uh, after 1844, revealed to them the light of the Sabbath truth. And those who loved the Lord embraced the Sabbath. And if you watch, uh, if you notice, brethren, um, just as how Pastor Robinson said, it's amazing to see that those who really love the Lord will follow every ray of light that God sheds on their path. They will accept the truth because it is true. They will hear the voice of Jesus when he's calling, when he's speaking, and they will embrace the truth. So you hear, you heard about these ministers who are now coming from different denominations, accepting the Sabbath truth. And from then on, God was going to give them more light. I know we're going to uh, learn more about uh, the ministry of Sister Ellen White, but you notice there was um, uh, uh, two brethren, uh, two brothers who were called before Sister White, um, uh, William Foy, um, before 1844, God gave him some visions, visions of glory. Um, but it's amazing to see that at every eventuality, at every event, God is something ready for his children. There's a light that they are supposed to follow. And if they embrace that light, God then takes them to another level. Uh, but I would like to, to open if there was somebody else who saw something or if there was any observation, anything that stood out for somebody in that uh, uh, documentary. Any thoughts, Reverend, before we pray and close for, for this evening? Or was there any questions, anything that was not clear at all?
from that video. A lot of this, um, much of what we are watching, brethren, is history. I know a lot of us, well, we are probably familiar with this history already, but the purpose of this uh, exercise is just to refresh our minds again, to, 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 to refresh our minds again, to remind each other where we're coming from, where we're going. All right? That is the main reason why we're doing this. Lest we forget. And it is one of Satan's strategies to make us forget our past history, how the Lord has led us in our past history. And if he erase our past history, he knows that we shall lose our identity. And I pray that will not happen to us. Um, if there's no any other... Um, Observations, brethren. We are going to. I just wanted to say. Yes, something. go ahead, Sister Dion. Um, it's interesting that, yes. you know, um, Christ, um, God used the um William Fox. You know, uh, that probably would have been the peak of um slavery, right? You know, at that time and. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've I've heard stories and I've read not heard stories like people said, oh, um, Ellen G. White was a woman of color, yeah, and I, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't argued about or anything like that. I haven't even thought about it because God loves everyone, but it's just interesting to know that He has given. And it's not, I hope it's not coming across as, you know, he has given every, he's given people an opportunity. So he gave um, the, the first person who was a man of color mm -hmm. and then he gave that opportunity. And though the man of color, you know, um, Foy, yeah, mm -hmm. phrase, yeah. William. He, he, William, he, um, he, um, did as much as he could and um, but bearing in mind slavery is uh, uh, around that time mm. and he he continued um doing the best that he could do for the lord and i i really do think the lord understood you know and took it from him well he didn't take it from him but it passed the baton on just like you know elijah passed the baton on to Eli elisha yeah Elisha, yeah. Makes sense, Elisha, yeah. Make, he passed it on. So God is so fair that he passed it on, not taking on board color. Color is not of significance, but he passed it on from mm. one to the other. And then he passed it on to a young woman of 17 year old. The previous ones were in their 20. So it's almost as if God went from from one stage to the next well he did he went from one stage to the next stage and whoever was willing and ellen g white she was willing to take it i mean it was she had some struggles but you know she 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 her dare to the will of the father and and here we are so i just want to say praise god and god is able to use any one of us it doesn't matter what color where we come from he is just a wonderful god he is so amazing he is so good to us you know we are his children and he will use us if we are just willing to allow him to use us despite the color color has no significance because we come from adam and eve i just wanted to say that amen amen, amen. you have preached to say amen well, God qualifies the cold. Um, and let no one say, I can't, when God is calling you. I mean, if you say you can't to God, I wonder. Um, I, 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 sometimes I, I, I shudder when I think um, uh, what it means. I know there's... Um, um, uh, there's another man who, um, who disappointed the Spirit of God. 
by refusing to take the work God had given him. After William Foy, who was the 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 other brother who was called um, um somebody remember his name? Is the Hazen Force. Hazen Force. Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it's his is a sad story, um, because God gave him the work, uh, and he refused. Um, he had his excuses until God said he was going to move on. That's when now the baton was moved. Uh, baton stick was uh, given to Sister White. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's we, how interesting that he didn't just, um, he gave him haze and he gave him one chance, two chance, three chances, you mm -hmm. know? So it wasn't like one and that was it. You know, oh, he kept yes. on giving him opportunities you know just like he gives us opportunity gives us the chance he doesn't just take away the light say, that's it one time that's no. it you know there's that three with that there's that three not number three and this is what he done he gave him that choice and each time he refused for whatever the reason may be i don't know because i wasn't there but he refused and it's just yep. so beautiful how god just oh. moves on to the next person you know praise god praise god Amen. Um, yes, indeed, he was given uh, uh, chances. Um, but uh, it, it makes me um, um, think that um, God, although he really wants to use any of us, he can't force us. If we can't accept his call, uh, the work he gives us, it's sad to say, but God will move on. But woe to that person who is left behind. I remember reading this story that um, uh, at one point he then decided that he was going to speak the vision that God had shown him. But uh, the spirit of God had left the man. And uh, he went before the people, people were waiting. He tried to speak the vision, but the thing was gone from him. He tried again, desperately tried, but the vision was taken from him. Now, when Sister White was then called into ministry, he went to, to, to listen when she was uh, sharing with the brethren what the Lord had given her to share. And he was the first person to confess and say, that vision is from the Lord. That is the vision God had given me. But I refused to share it and God took it away from me. And indeed, God has called this woman. And he said sad words that I'm a lost man. Sad words indeed. Um, so I think what we can take away from the thought you are sharing with us, Mr. Dion, God has given us something to do. Uh, Let's ask him to give us strength to do it. If we feel that we are not able, we're not capable, he is the one who equips us. So um, may God help us to, uh, to ask him for the, for, the cap um, for the capacity to do the work he calls us to do. I mean, brethren, we're going to stop here. Uh, oh, there's another hand. Sorry, Just Sister Charlene's hand. Sorry about that, the interruption. Yeah. Go ahead, Sister Charlene, please. Good evening. Thank you. I uh, really liked that uh, film. And I was just, you know, while I was watching it, I came in late while I was watching and just saw that God is fighting for his church and fighting for the truth to be given to, to his people. He wanted them to know the truth about the Sabbath. And he put these really wonderful people like, like Ellen, our sister Ellen G. White and the others there in, in place with these beautiful visions to show us like this is the way, walk here in it. And it just made me just feel more respect. And I mean, I have a lot of respect for God, more to have more love for him and just saw his passion in, in wanting to bring this wonderful message to us so that we can be saved. And it just, just yeah, really made me love the Lord more. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We thank God for, for his mercy. It's because of his mercy that uh, he allows us to, to learn what is truth. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. 
Uh, so amen. Thank you uh, for for that uh, for those uh, observations, brethren, and uh, the thoughts that were shared. I'm going to ask uh, Sister Charlene, if you don't mind, Sister Charlene, please give us a um, closing prayer um, and thank God for the um, um, message, uh, for, for these documentaries that we have to remind us of where we're coming from, where we've come from, where we're going to remind us our identity. Help us that God may help us to commit ourselves to this truth. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful documentary, Lord. It just ignited a fire in my heart, Lord, that it just shows that you are such a wonderful Father. You want us to go. You, you're pleading for us in the sanctuary, Lord. You made this beautiful church, Lord. It's your church, Lord, and we need to stick by it. All the work you put into us to show it, show the Sabbath to the beautiful uh, people who started, like Ellen G. White and the others who started the church, Lord. So much effort was gone into you. Carefully show uh, these people these visions and so that we can know these things, Lord. Help us to keep these truths to our in our hearts, Lord, and to share these things with others that you fought so hard for, Lord, because you are so caring and so loving. You don't want one soul to <clears throat> to be lost, excuse me. Don't want one soul to be lost, Lord. Help us to fight for your cause the way you fought for your church, Lord, and to share others, the, the God, share the gospel with others and those who don't know about the Sabbath, Lord. But we need your help to give us the means and the, the, the wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Send us the Holy Spirit that we can share this beautiful message and that people can be saved, Lord, not because of our efforts because of yours lord <clears throat> we're thanking you lord <clears throat> excuse me for just being so <clears throat> amazingly and caring and being our savior in jesus precious name amen 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 thank you sister charlene for the prayer thank you brethren for tuning in this evening uh tomorrow we're going to be moving on to ep episode number five uh where we're going to uh uh, learn more about uh, the ministry of Sister White. Um, and again, this this is just reminding ourselves um, our identity, where we've come from, knowing your history, knowing your identity. May God bless you, brethren. Have a good evening. Tomorrow morning, we'll have our morning prayers, as always, from 4.45 to 5.30 a.m. And then from 5.30 to 6.30 we have Desire of Ages uh, reading. God bless you, brethren, and have a wonderful evening. Amen. 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 Good night. Good night, good night, brethren.